Okay, well, as you can see, we're going to do another one of these crazy recordings. Try to get this one, of course, up on iTunes U. And um, so we've got a lot of administrative stuff to go over. First of all, I'm going paperless. I'm not even going to give you a copy of the syllabus. You can uh, see how tree friendly we are. Here's the course web page. It's COSC 425. The rest of the stuff is prefix is the same. And here's the syllabus. You just click on this. And here's our syllabus. There's office hours are the same. Office is the same. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the goal of the course, the objective. <clears throat> now, oh, <laughs> some of you are in computer systems, and we just, I just gave you a task to memorize the seven levels of abstraction of a computer system. Others of you have already had computer systems and already know the seven levels of abstraction of a computer system. So let's start with Ashley over here and say, what's the top <laughs> level, level seven? Do you remember? No. Okay, you, want to pay? you can always pass. Do you remember? High order? Uh, close, but no cigar. Danny? Application. Ap application is level seven. Okay, what's the next one? Um, higher order. High order language, level, level six. is level... What's the number? Six. Level six. Do you remember what's level five? No. That's fine. You can pass. What? Assembly. Yes, assembly. Do you remember what's uh, five? Oh, uh, operating system. Good. Yeah. Operating system. Do you remember what the next one is? You remember what the next one is? ISA. ISA, which stands for what? Into, well, at least you got the initials. Instruction set architecture. Do you remember the language? It's machine language. That's the machine language. Okay, now, what's below the machine language? Oh, this would be really hard because... I was going to say machine Yeah, no, the next one down is, this is, the, you wouldn't, it would be... No, you skipped one. Do you know, what's the next one below the, below the ISA? Do you remember? We're going to show it, I'm going to show you on a slide here in a minute. Okay. Oh, you want to pass? What's the next one? Microcode. Microcode level, and what's the bo very bottom Logic one? Gate. Logic gate level. Now, what we're going to do in this class is we're going to study the bottom three levels. Cool. And generally, this is where the hardware is. So there is a divide between the upper levels, which are normally done in software, and the lower levels, which are normally done in hardware. But anything you can do in software, you can do in hardware and vice versa. And so sometimes the, the, the boundary between the software and the hardware uh, can can change a little bit. Um, and there are aspects of them that are common, and some people think we shouldn't distinguish between hardware and software, but anyway, whatever. So we're going to explore all of those issues. All right, so that's the, that's the, um, that's the main goal of the course. And um, <clears throat> now, uh, here's the book. <clears throat> the book is the same book that we used in computer systems. Okay, and since I wrote the book and I'm requiring you to buy the book, then it's not ethical for me to force you to give me a profit. So I will say that what I get, the royalty rate that I get on this book is 15% of every retail sale of, the new book, of a new book. If you buy a new book and bring it to me and show me the receipt, I will gladly refund to you 15% of the retail price. But you can't buy this book if you're in the computer systems course and you buy the book new and you're taking this course too, I think I will only give you one 15% rebate and not one for each course. <laughs> anyway, so that's, uh, but I want to make sure that you have that option. That option is available to you if you want to take advantage of it. Because there is, you know, I mean, because you basically have no choice. And so therefore that wouldn't be <laughs> right for me to profit at your expense by requiring you to buy my book. Okay, now, um, now, here is, we have another piece of administrative detail to work out. As you have all noticed, we have scheduled, this is a three lecture hours per week, but we have scheduled a fourth day, namely Friday. So here's how that works, it's, it's going to work. This course 
is one of the is the only course in here at Pepperdine in the computer science program that actually has a hardware lab. So we can consider the lab to be kind of like a homework. Now, the, and, and, I, and even though I, I put on the schedule every Friday from 3 to 4, there are only six labs total for the whole thing. So we're not going to have to meet every Friday. As a matter of fact, each one of these labs is actually doable in two hours if, you're, if you don't waste time. You, we can get it done in two hours. And typically what happens is people would rather meet one Friday and stay for two hours rather than have, having to stay another hour the next Friday to get it done. Okay? So basically is all that, what that means is that we, is, all, is all that is going to be required is basically if you get everything, each lab done in a one, two hour block, it just means six Fridays throughout the year. And they're all scheduled. So here's the schedule. Um, here's the lab schedule. January 10th, 24th, 7th, February 7th, 21st, and March 21st, and April 4th. This means that we have a lab this Friday, okay, at 3. But if you guys are willing to stay till well, two things. We could either, because this class starts at 3, right? We could either go from 3 to 5, or if you want, I can check on the room availability, but we all have to be able to meet, and we could do it at a different time, maybe earlier in the day. But I have to check on availability because it's in the physics lab. Are you with me? Yes. So I'll tell you what, let's not try to do that right now, but why don't we, um, why don't we group email? or something like that, and try to come up with a plan. Because I don't want to have to be here every Friday either, afternoon, I mean, on those days too. And so that, I think it would be pretty painless only just six times. Are you with me? Is everybody clear? And, all the, and the first day of each lab is, the, that, those dates on, that, on there are the first day of each lab. So let's do that, and, but then if we come up with the time, then I'm going to have to check with the, room, uh, the lab availability. To, to me. But I'm pretty sure that, I mean, in the past, They've, we've done it earlier on Fridays, you know, is, a, is usually one. The, I told you about the text rebate. Here's some interesting papers that I've posted for you to read. And here's the first assignment. The assignments here are all on the web page now. I don't have a separate PDF printout for each one because, because the assignments now are all paper assignments. Okay? So we're, there's only going to be, I think there's maybe two or three exercises where we're actually going to write some microcode programs and run them. But um, so a lot of this is digital design and digital design is you, you do that on, you know, you're not writing, we're not going to write a lot of programs in here. We are going to write some microcode programs to when we talk about data flow, you know, and uh, CPU organization. But that's going to be way late in the course. So I'm not even going to get a courses. I'm not even going to set up courses for us. And it's all on paper. So unfortunately, that means it's due at 5 o'clock the day that it's due. <laughs> you can't have till midnight because you're not going to hand in anything electronically. All right? And so here's the first, uh, here's the first uh, assignment. It's Chapter 10. These assignments from Chapter 10, the first two sections of Chapter 10. Now. Basically, the way the book is organized is those of you who have had computer systems before, you know that we did basically chapters 1 through 7. I don't know if you remember that, but we did chapters 1 through 7. What we're going to do here is we're going to do chapters 10 through 12. All right? 10 through 12. And um, fortunately, for those of you who are taking computer systems now, chapter 10 we can start chapter 10 without knowing anything else that went before. And it's kind of cool the way it works um, so that you guys can take both courses at the same time because by the time we get to the point, by the time we get to like chapter 11 and start doing chapter 12, by the time we get to that point, at that point you will have learned enough in the computer systems class to be able to do this course concurrently. Are you with me? 
So it, it, it works. It, it's kind of serendipitous how that just kind of works out. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's possible to do that. Okay, so any questions about the course? And on the syllabus, there's how many, you know, there's a lab component as well as a homework component as well as an exam component to the grade. It's all on the syllabus. Are we good? Mm -hmm. All right, then. Let's, let us begin our journey to computer organization. Now, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is uh, start in chapter 10. The title of chapter 10 is <clears throat> Combinational Circuits. Now this is going to be, this should be very familiar to you because basically what this is, is propositional calculus. Right? And we already know propositional calculus. We know De Morgan's laws and all that stuff. Okay? But <clears throat> there's going to be a, is a slight variation on the way we're going to do it. So, combinational circuits. Now, we just went through those seven levels of abstraction, right? And what we're going to do here is we're going to do the microcode level. We're going to do the lower levels of abstraction. Microcode level, logic gate level, and now I've tacked on two different levels here. Because, you know, <coughs> we live in, the, in a universe, right? And we build these computers out of elements from the universe. Silicon and copper and stuff like that, right? So the thing of it is, is that below the logic gate level, there has to be a way to make an individual logic gate. Do you see what I mean? And so there is actually an electronic device level that's below the logic gate level. And so I've just continuing down, I've labeled this level zero. Now, do you guys know, does anybody here, when you were a kid, did you ever like play with electronic devices? Can you give me an example of an electronic device? Game Boy. <laughs> Game Boy. No. Now that's pretty high level. I'm talking about wiring up little parts, the parts that go into a radio or something like that. Oh, Did you ever, the little, yeah, what are those things? Can you name some of those things? The, uh, you put them on a circuit board, but what do you plug into a circuit? What are some of the things that you plug into a circuit board? Do you know any of these devices? Resistors, that's one device. That's a really good one. That's, that's a component. That's a, yeah, what, what else? What other things? Say it again. Transistors, <laughs> that's a really important one. Resistors, transistors, what's another one? See, I wish we made you guys take e &M, Like we used to. Electricity and magnetism. What's another one? Did you take, did you take, took you took the class, to, yeah. Oh, oh, you should know this then. What's another one? Do you remember the oscillating circuit? What goes, what makes up the oscillating, the two components that make up an oscillating circuit? Mm -hmm. Do you remember a capacitor? Yep. Mm -hmm. Ah, there you have yep. a capacitor and, and an inductor. Those are all things. Mm -hmm. But two of the ones that you mentioned, um, resistors and transistors, they, you use those to make up an individual gate. Mm -hmm. if, if we have some time, I can actually show you how that's done uh, later on in the course. But, <coughs> okay, so, so the, what is abstraction? Hiding details. So those details, the electronic device devices, those are hidden at the logic gate level. At the logic gate level, we just have a chip that has a gate in it, and we don't have to worry about what makes up the gate. But then, what, how do you make a transistor? Well, that's the physics level. And physics is the most fundamental of all the natural sciences. It's at the lowest level of abstraction. Even in the life sciences, right? Physics. And then from physics, physics, we study the atoms and the subatomic particles. And you put together a bunch of atoms and you get what? Molecules. You put together a bunch of molecules and you get what in an organism? A cell. And you put together cells and what do you get? Organism. An organism. You put together organ, organism. What do you get? People. 
the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom. Right? So everything is le levels of abstraction. And the bottom, the most fundamental one is physics of the natural sciences. And then mathematics is the language that ties it all together. All right. Now, so uh, just to, uh, to go back and emphasize, where we are now, we are talking about level one. We are at the logic gate level here. Are you with me? And so what we're doing, just to give you an idea of where we're headed, the re re reason I say we could start chapter 10 without knowing anything that went be goes before, is we are temporarily jumping down. Normally in the, you know, in the computer systems, we start at the top and we learn the next level down and the next level. What we're doing is we're skipping down to the bottom one. And now we're going to skip down to the bottom and we're going to kind of like work our way up. And so as we work our way up, we're going to meet the, feet, the folks that are working their way down, you see, in the middle. You see what I mean? And we're going to meet at the, mic, at the uh, level three. We're going to meet at the instruction set architecture level. So that's what, just to show you, I mean, just so that you know where we're headed with this, we are at the lowest level of abstraction. Well, almost lowest level of abstraction, the logic gate level in a computer system. Is everybody with me? And these logic gates... They are, they are combinational circuits. Now here's the definition of a combinational circuit. A combina in a combinational circuit, the output depends only on the input. Are you with me? That's going to be very important. Why do you suppose this is important? Why are we emphasizing that for a combinational circuit, the output depends only on the input? Because why? There's going to be what in the future? What are we going to, what are we going to con contrast this with? What's, what's the other possibility? If, the out, if with a combinational circuit, the output depends only on the input, that means that probably sometime in the future, we're going to study a device, you know, in a few weeks. It depends on the input as well, something yeah, that the output doesn't just depend on the input. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh? Whoa, how could that be? Well, we'll see. Okay, so does everybody understand? With a combinational circuit, the output depends only on the input. Right? Now here's how we get here's how we're gonna visualize it. The way we visualize it is we have this, this is called a black box. It looks white, but <laughs> it's called a black box because what's abstraction? How do you, because what? What's, what do you see about that black box? Do you see any detail? No. So th th that's why it's called a black box because you can't see the detail inside of it. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So this is an example. So this black box is an example of a combinational circuit that has three inputs and two outputs. And I'm here to tell you that those arrows, those lines with those arrows, those are physical copper wires. Are you with me? Because mm -hmm. this is hardware. So those, er those lines with the arrows, those are physical copper wires. And on Friday, you're going to do physical copper wires and you're going to plug it into one side and you're going to plug it into the other side, and just like these arrows show. That's what you're going to do this Friday. Okay? Is everybody with me on this? Now, how in the world are, you going to, are, are we going to specify what this circuit does? Oh, by the way, this, everything's in binary, right? Right. So that means that the signal coming in here can either be a 0 or a 1 on this ABC, and a signal coming out on X and Y is either going to be what? 0 or 1. Are you with me? Now, how can we, if, if I said, hey, here's a black box that does something, what are you going to, you're going to ask me, say, well, what does it do? How am I going to tell you what this does? How can I tell you what this black box does? I would have to give you what? I would have to tell you what? A function, yeah, even, even more brute force than that. Even more, no, even more brute force than that. We, we, the output depends only on the input. So, and each one has, can either be a zero or a one. So how could I tell you what this combinational circuit does? Conditions 
a li yeah, a list, but actually we did this in formal methods at the very beginning. Uh, a truth table? Yeah, a truth table. You could do it, you could, you, you, could, you could specify it with a truth table. Yeah? So, the, there's, there's actually three methods to describe a combinational circuit. One, you could give the truth table, because, and why, do you, why is it called a combinational circuit? Because what is a truth table? It's a list of all the possible what? Combinations of the what? Of the input. It's the, all the possible, you list all the possible combinations of the input, and then for each combination you say what the output is. So that's a truth table. Another way to give it is the formal methods way to do it. Because in formal methods, what is an expression? Yeah, but what is an expression? Yes, it's just it is true that you can evaluate an expression. And we do and that and it's either a constant or a variable. A constant or a variable is an expression. And and the variables are the lowercase letters, right? E is expression. If if e, if e is an expression, then parentheses e is an expression. And you infix, in, yeah, if star is an infix operator, then, and E and, uh, e and F are expressions, e and then E star F is an expression, and then what's the other one? Pre, oh, unary prefix. Yeah? And then that, that's, those are Boolean expressions, and so we could, give the, we could give the Boolean expression, and then we could evaluate. So that's another way to specify what a combinational circuit does. And a third way to specify what it does is with a logic diagram. Now, here's the thing, you guys. All three of these are super common in digital circuit design. Okay? All of these are common in, in, in digital circuit design. And when we do our lab on Friday, we're going to look at spec sheets, at data sheets from manufacturers. And these manufacturers, they use all three ways. They, sometimes they do truth tables, sometimes they do Boolean algebra expressions, sometimes they do logic diagrams. Frequently they do all three. So we have to know how to do that. We have to know how to, are you with me on that? To specify what a combinational circuit is. So first of all, let's take a look at, the, let's take a look at each one of these three. First one is a truth table. A truth table, the reason it's called a combinational circuit is because what a truth table does, well, what do we know about a combinational circuit? The what? Output depends only on the input. The output depends only on the input. So we list all possible input. Combinations, combinations of the input mm -hmm. and we say what the output is. Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So that's, so here's an example that, now I just, this is just some random truth table pulled out of the air for that first black box diagram that we saw. Now, does everybody understand how to read this table? What happens is the A, the B, and the C are the inputs, and the X and the Y are the outputs. And notice that we've done all possible combinations of the input. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Now, the way we would do this in formal methods is, there's this a direct correlation. What is zero in formal methods? False. False. And what is one? True. 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 Yeah? And that's why it's called a truth table. That's how you interpret those signals. Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. And then because there's two outputs, then we have to show each possible output of X for every combination of input and, each, possible, and each, each outcome of y. And I'm just, this is given. I'm just giving this. I'm, this, is one, this is an example of describing a combinational circuit. But it all goes back to that original black box that has three coming in and two coming out. Is, there, are, is everybody clear on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now, and here is, um, that one had three inputs. If you have four inputs, then how many combinations do we have? A lot more. How many? Two to the fourth. Yeah. Which is? Uh, 16. 16. Yeah. 
As, now, is everybody with me on that? So the more inputs you have, you got two to however many inputs you have, that's how many rows you have on the truth table. So here's, this would be, what would the box look like? What would the black box diagram look like? You'd have a box and there'd be what? A, B, C, D coming in and X, Y coming out. And here's just some, you know, I, I could say, okay, this is what this circuit does. I'm just, this is one way to specify the circuit. Now, is everybody clear on that? Because the out, and that's all we have to specify because the output depends only on the input. Are we good? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the first one. So there's not much there. There's not much more to that. <laughs> okay. That's just one way to specify the circuit. Now, here is where you guys are going to be a little thrown for a little bit of a loop, I think. <clears throat> the next way to do this is with Boolean algebra. Now, here's the thing about Boolean algebra. In digital circuit design, Unfortunately for us, the standard practice is to use a different notation from what we're used to. And not only that, it's to use a different order of precedence from what we're used to. So here's what we're going to do. I, it's, it's important that we know how the industry, you know, to do it the way it's done in industry. So we're going to have to switch gears here and use a slightly different Boolean algebra system notation from what we're used to. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now look, you guys. According to this slide, how did we, here, how did we do or? How did we do disjunction? Uh, mm-hmm. Disjunction, we did, this was or, this was disjunction, and conjunction was and, and furthermore, um, negation was what? That, right? Remember that? Well, guess, what does this say? Disjunction, what symbol do they use? Plus, and what do they use for and? Dot. Dot. And what do they use for this? Prime. And not only that, why do they use plus and dot? Because which one has higher precedence? In, in algebra, which one has higher precedence? Addition or multiplication? multiplication. So similarly, in the Boolean algebra that they use in the industry, conjunction has higher precedence than disjunction. Now, here is what I'm going to insist that we do. I'm going to insist that when we see the plus sign, we say or, and when we see the multiply sign, we say and, because that's what it's doing. Are you with me? So let's just get used to saying, or for this, and for this, not for this, which is a prime, right? So look, the way we do prime, the way we did prime here, the way we did not here, we, we would, we would, if we said not P like this, how do we say it here? We say P prime. Or we're going to say P prime, not not P? Well... <laughs> Not not P, that would be double negation. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, either way. Okay. Either way. P I, I have a tendency to say P prime. Okay. Because you know it's P prime. Or you could say, but sometimes, yeah, either way is fine here. But let's make sure that when we see this, we say or, and when we see this, we say and. Because that's, we have to get in our minds, we have to get used to it, to doing it that way. All right, and now, because of this, we also, now, you know, we learned a whole, remember we had this handout and we had a whole system of equation on an, an equational deductive system, right? Mm -hmm. And it had axioms and stuff like that. Well, in digital logic design, you know, we don't have the same set of axioms because everything is all different. So basically what we're going to do for our Boolean algebraic system, we are going to have, um, we're going to have 10 axioms. They will all be familiar to you. 
but we're going in this system these are going to be the axioms and the system that we learned some of them were axioms and some of them were not but in this system we're going to start with this set of axioms so we're going to do some proofs not very many but we are going to do a few we're going to do a few proofs but in our proof system we're going to first of all we're going to use this notation this is going to have higher precedence than this and furthermore these are going to be our axioms are you with me is everybody clear on this and fortunately <laughs> at least fortunately they have the same words <laughs> you know that describe the properties so these are 10 properties of boolean algebra each property each property applies to what to both what why are there yeah, there's only five listed there but it says 10 properties well why are there 10 properties if there's only five bullet lists because each one applies to what destruction and conjunction yes yes or, or and and, and. each one applies to or and and all right so the first property is commutative the second property is associative the third property is distributive the fourth property is identity and the fifth property is the complement property okay and here they all are well each and each one of them applies each one of them applies to both and and or okay so now actually so commutative what did we actually we had a different word for this in formal methods symmetry right um, but <clears throat> another common word for that is commutative so the commutative law is that X now how do you say this what is this what does the first commutative law here say X or Y, X or y equals y or x and this one is x and y equals y. y and x and that's equals and that is equals yeah you know we're not going to distinguish between equals and equal veils and because they don't do that in industry okay. yeah we just use equals is everybody with me on commutative mm -hmm. okay associative that's the same as we as we did before so what does this first associative law say if you have X or Y and do that first and then do what or it with Z that's the same thing as doing what Y or Z first and then oring X with that are you with me is that good mm -hmm. same way with uh, and if you do X and Y first and then and that with Z you get the same thing as doing y and z first and then x and then doing x and that so the parentheses work the same way right you do what's in parentheses first is everybody good okay mm -hmm. and we learned in formal methods that conjunction distributes over disjunction and disjunction distributes over conjunction in this one these are axioms in this system these are axioms so what does this say if you do what? what? Well, if you do what first here? If you do Y and Z first, and if you do X or that, it's the same thing as doing what? X or Y first, and then X or Z second, and then ending, ending them together. All right, and notice that this is, this is one where you have or, but it also works for and. If you have if you do y or z first and you x and you and x and you do x and that that's the same thing as doing x and y first and then x and z second and then oring those together now do these look familiar do you remember that disjunction distributes over conjunction and vice versa from formal methods this should be familiar to you it's just that the notation is a little different here Actually, uh, there's another slide coming up here. I'm not sure if it's the next one. I don't think so. But we could take advantage of, remember how in formal methods, anytime you had ands and ors, you had to do what? Anytime you had a, a, a string of ands and or, disjunction and conjunction, what did you always have to do? Separate them with yeah, you had, you had to put parentheses because it was ambiguous, which one, because they had the same precedence. 
But here, they have different precedents. They have different precedents. So there's actually some unnecessary parentheses here. Where are the unnecessary parentheses? There's actually three. Yeah, in the second one, it's the X and Y and the X and Z, those parentheses. But there's another place parentheses. In the first one. In the, the first, first one, the, the Y and Z on the first one. Oh, yeah. All right? Yes. So we're going <coughs> to, that's, and that's how you, we have to get used to doing it this way because this is the way it's, this is the standard practice. Okay, so I think there's another slide that's going to show that. And now here is the, here are the identity laws. Now how do we say the first identity law? X or zero equals X. This, what is this? Do you remember what this was called in formal methods? What does that correspond to in formal methods? It's the identity of or. What is the identity of or? Well, in formal methods, it's false. Yeah, because P or false is P. Right? And then what was the what's the next one? Identity of identity of an x n true equals x <coughs> is everyone clear on this one now the con the complement one so these are the two complement laws these are maybe not well actually they are very familiar the complement law says that this and by the way this is the definition of complement this is given x what is the com given any expression Given any expression, what is the complement of that expression? It's the expression such that if you do what? See, look. What is x prime? Given x, what is the complement of x? It's the, it's the expression for which if you do what? You. If you or it, you get what? Yeah. 1. And if you and it with x, you get 0. Yeah. That's the definition of the complement. This is the defining equation for the complement. Now, does everybody see that? Now, can you tell me? Ha ha! Here comes a good. Here comes. Here comes something. Can you tell me what theorem from formal methods this first equation represents? Now, some of you guys who tutored should be able to know this. That very first one is a famous, that very first one is one that you should recognize, that you should recognize. I think I, think I heard it. No? It's like, it's like on the first, it's like the first one. It's like the Say it again? Deviation. No? That very first, that first law has a name, has a name in formal methods. What is it? That is excluded middle. Now look, do you see that it's excluded middle? Yeah. Right? What is excluded middle? P or not P equals true. Yeah, P or not P. That's P or not P equals true. Equals true, yeah. The first one is excluded middle. What's the second one called? Contradiction. That's contradiction. If you and X in this you get false. Yeah. See? And all that stuff. Hardware is based on all that propositional calculus. It is. That's like the whole, all the whole. All. And what, what are we doing with these gates? We're going to build a whole what? Computer. We're going to build a computer. And it's all propositional calculus. Pretty amazing. Okay. <clears throat> so now. Because of this precedence, because complement has the highest precedence, then and, and then or has the lowest precedence, that means that, and we, we mentioned this before, so does everybody see that we can write the distributive laws this way? Yeah? Are we good? Okay. And also we can write the complement laws this way without the parens. Are you with me? Because the prime doesn't apply to, it's not x or x whole thing prime. So prime has higher precedence than or. Right. Negation has higher precedence than or. Is everybody with me on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And furthermore, associativity. If we have two ors together, it doesn't matter whether you or the first two together and then do the second one or the second one together. We can do what? Oh. We can just dispense with the parens. Mm -hmm. Just like we did in front, just like we removed unnecessary parentheses in formal methods. 
Is everybody good? And now do you remember duality? Do you remember how to take the dual? Duality is really important in circuit design. Do you remember how to take the dual? Remember what the dual of an expression was? Well, I mean, here it is. <laughs> but how do, we, how do you take the dual of an expression? Everywhere there's an or, you make it a what? Mm -hmm. And everywhere there's an and, you make it an or. And everywhere there's a one, you make it a zero. Everywhere there's a zero, you make it a one. Everywhere there's a true, you make it false. Everywhere there's false, you make it true. Yeah? That's duality. And, by the way, did you notice? Here, did you notice that each one of these is actually dual? Did you notice that each one of these is its dual? This is true? And here's, right? Yeah? All right. So now let's do a proof. Let's do a proof. The first thing that we're going to prove is the idempotent property. What does idempotency mean? How do we write, how do we say this first one? X or X equals X. So let's do idempotent. All right. We're going to go around the room. Are you ready? <clears throat> All right, sports fans. <laughs> See if this is a little darker. Oh, that's much better. Okay. Let's let's prove uh, proof of item potence. Proof of or. Uh, we're going to do of or. Proof of of. Um, actually, we're going to do them both. At the same time? No. I'll do the first step. We're going to start with X and, oh, sorry. Oh, not sorry. I take back, I'm not sorry. We're going to start with X or X. I'm going to do the first step because it's, I'm going to, we're going to pull a rabbit out of the hat. No, we're going to use identity of and. <laughs> okay, Ben, you can be first. <laughs> Equals by identity. <laughs> identity of, now we're going to write and like this. So, so Ben, if, if, how can I use identity, there's actually a couple of ways you could use identity of and here. But how can, how can I pull a rabbit out of a hat and use identity of and with this expression? Uh, make it x or x and y. Yes, and we're going to do that by doing x or x and one like this. We're going to do the in parentheses, right? Okay, great, got it. Uh, you got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, Ashley. This equals by the complement of or. <laughs> now, so go back and look at the complement of or. We're also kind of well, pulling. You're going to make the one yes, the yes, that's what we're going to do. So what do we have? So x or x and, and x or x prime. x or x prime. Is everybody with me on this? Are we good? Okay. Now, Shane, can you tell us what we should do here? What are we trying to get this to? We're trying to get this to be one, right? Is that what we're trying to get it to? No, no, sorry, we're trying to get it to X. We're trying to get it to X. But anyway, how can, what can we, what can we do? This is a little bit of a tricky one, but I think it's similar to what we've done in formal methods. No, I don't know. There's something that should, I, let me give you a hint. Factor. In algebra, how did you factor? Mm -hmm. 
What do you think, Michael? Distributive. Distributive. What distributes over what? Distributive of or distributes over or distributes over and. So then, so then, what is this the same as? Yes. Now, Oscar, what do you think we should do now? Identity. Yes, identity. Uh, oh, no. Sorry. Sorry to. <laughs> no. Man, man, what do you think? Compliment. Compliment of what? Compliment of and. Compliment of and. Okay, so Sam, by compliment of and, what is that? X or zero. X or zero. And now, Chloe? Um, the identity of equals one. Identity. So identity of or what? X. Boom. And that's what we were trying to prove is that this equals this. What a good proof. Is that a cool proof? Do I see the symbols or like four? Uh, either way, it's fine. Okay. Now, now let's, now let's, oh, did I? What did I do? Well, in the beginning you started using just the symbols. Oh, you're right. Oh, I shouldn't, I should have said and. You know, I, let's oh, make I this and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just, let's, let's, be, let's be consistent. And. You know, when I say it, and then I, yeah, anyway. Now, let's do another one really quick. Can you catch this over here? Okay, now, who was last? Um, I did last. You did the last one. Okay, so watch this, Annie. Let's do a dual proof. Um, what are we proving? Item potency. Now, watch this. Let's do this really quick. The dual proof, what will, instead of starting with X and or x, or let's do what? x and x. So now what, this is going to be equal by what? Now just look over here. This is going to be equal by what? Instead of identity of identity of or. Okay, real quick. Okay, Ben? Um, by the complement of and. This is going to be x and x what? Uh, Or what? One. No. Or zero. Or zero. Okay. okay. And Ashley, this is equal by the what? Uh, the of what? Of four. No. Or of and. Complement of and what? X. Or X and X. X and X. What? Or we say or. <laughs> Yes. Is everybody clear on that? Shane equals by what? Now what distributes over what? And distributes over or. And that will be what? X or X prime. And then Michael, this equals by what? Of what? Of or. of or. X and one. And this equals Oscar by what? Identity. Of what? Identity. Yeah. Of and, yes. What? X. Boom. And what do we notice here? What do we notice about this proof compared to this proof? For every, <laughs> yeah, for every proof that you have, there is a, a dual proof. Because all of our axioms are duals. 
Okay. So look, what does this say? Once you have proved one expression is a theorem, what have you proved? Yeah. It's dual. You get it's dual, and you don't even have to do this. Is that an axiom? That's a, that's a uh, what do you call it? Meta theorem. Mm -hmm. That was one of the meta theorems that we had before. Yeah. Is that cool? That is cool. I think it's way cool. Good deal. See you all tomorrow, same time, same station.